so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to Thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Blessings, everyone. I hope you're all blessed on this Sabbath day, and I hope you can all hear me as well. Can you guys hear me just to make sure? Okay, cool. All right, so let's all get on our knees and begin with prayer. And lift holy hands. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for bringing us together on this, your Sabbath day. Thank you for blessing us with your truth that is written within the Bible. And I pray, Father, as we go into this truth today, that you increase our understanding and our knowledge of that which we read. And most of all, may our love increase for you and for Christ. May we see Calvary more clearly. May we understand what was done on that day 2,000 years ago. and May we appreciate it even more. I pray that you bridle my tongue and any tongue that shall speak on your behalf. I thank you for changing the showbread. And we pray, Father, for all of those on our prayer lists, those that are lost, that they may be saved. And we also thank you for your hedge of angels and your angels that are with us this Sabbath day, as well as your presence. And I pray, Father, that as we look into the study of the burnt offering, that we may see in our lives how we can 
give our whole life as an offering unto you and how we can give offerings to you even in these days after the cross of Christ and that we may look on the examples of the patriarchs and prophets of old and be inspired and I pray father as we look into you know your the truth of your word and how Satan has tr Satan has tried to corrupt the word that we also have a more established faith in the faith once delivered unto the saints which we have in a, which you've given us in our language the English language and we thank you for that father and we thank you also, also for exposing the wiles of Satan and so we pray father for an increase in faith hope and love this day and we uplift and pray this prayer in the name of your son our savior and king the lord jesus christ amen okay let me just share my screen Alberta says he can't hear. Can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. All right. So I've just shared my screen. So if you click on where it says live, you'll be able to see my screen as we go through today's study. So let me click off WhatsApp. Burnt offering. Cool. So last week we did part two of the study and this week will be part three. And like I said before, I believe it's four parts. So there'll be this week and next week, if that's how the Lord would have it. So just quickly, we'll just look over where what we did, what we went through last week. Should be quite quick. Um, so the current slide. So last week we looked at how David, he... Um, he was commanded by God to give a burnt offering when he bought the threshing floor from Arona, or Ornan, Arona, however you say his name. Um, well, it's Arona in Second Samuel and it's Ornan in First Chronicles. But we see in the Bible how different names are given to different people, or some people, the same person can also have multiple different, can be known by different names. And even today, in today's world, like I have a cousin, I know him as Rohan, but in his school, when he was a kid, he would be known as Ethan. So his friends would call him Ethan, I would call him Rohan. So anyway, um, so here we see in Second Samuel that um, this was when, of course, David bought the threshing floor. He offered the burnt offering. Of course, the angel of the Lord appeared unto David there, which we know was Jesus Christ. And when we saw how, because of David buying that threshing floor and the, the whole mountain, Mount Moriah from Ornan, that was then where um, Solomon built the temple on Mount Moriah, and of course, which is also known as Mount Zion in the Bible. And of course, that was where Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, but the ram, whose horns were caught in the thorn bush, representing Christ, was then given to take the place of Isaac. And so that's why Mount Moriah was so important, Mount Zion, because of that's where Abraham's faith was tested and it prevailed. Um, his faith in the Lord and so and it's also where we saw the gospel message preached on Mount Moriah because of what happened with the ram there and so we see how the Lord used the evil to bring about good so the evil was the fact that David had um, he'd numbered Israel and he uh, Israel as well as David were, were puffed up in pride at that point because they'd become very rich they'd won a lot of wars and what have you and so um, because of that, David repented, though, and God sent Gad to then go and buy Mount Moriah. So it turned into a good thing. And then eventually, that's oh, was on top of Mount Moriah, where Solomon, like I said, built the temple. Um, there's like a rock on Mount Moriah, on Mount Zion, Moriah, where um, it is believed that it was on that rock where Abraham actually sacrificed that ram that day. And that's why today... You have that Muslim mosque there called the Dome of the Rock because they built the, the mosque on top of the rock and the rock is now in the middle of the mosque. But um, of course, when Christ returns, that mosque is going to be destroyed. And when the heaven, when the earth is made new, there will be a new temple on that on Mount Zion, on Mount Moriah, where the 144,000 will dwell. And we also saw about how Manoah 
the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and he also offered a burnt offering unto God. And then we've got, so today we're just going to look at um, a couple more instances in the Old Testament where we see the burnt offering is taking place. And then we're also going to look into how we can give offerings to God even in our day. And how Paul also goes on to compare the burnt offering to giving offerings to God in our time. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 36 to 39, this is perhaps the most famous of all the burnt offerings which are given in the scripture. We see in verse 36, it says, And it came to pass at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. So just stopping there. Oh, in case any of you have never actually seen this or read this story before, it's when... Elijah and the prophets of Baal are having a contest on uh, Mount Carmel. And the, the contest was this, that um, they would both set up a bullock, they would both set up an altar, and around the altar they would set up like a, um, like a trench with water, and they would both call on their gods. So um, the prophets of Baal would call upon their gods, and Elijah would call upon his gods. And whichever... Um, whichever God answered by fire from heaven, that would be known, that would be the true God. So obviously the prophets of Baal, they called upon Baal and no fire came down from heaven. Elijah called upon Jehovah and we see what happens. So in verse 37 it says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is the God, the Lord, he is the God. So here we see it wasn't just the burnt sacrifice that was consumed by the fire. It was the wood, the stones, the dust, and even the water was consumed by this fire that came down from heaven. And now, so just backtracking a bit on this. So Elijah, obviously, he was um, cast out from Israel by, well, he, he had to flee, right? Because they wanted to kill him. Because at that time, Ahab was the king and his idolatrous wife Jezebel was the queen. And so he goes and he flees. And he prays to God that um, the people of Israel might repent by God sending judgments upon them. It's that prayer that we sometimes pray of, Father, please humble them or shake them up to wake them up. Because sometimes people need a severe trial to come upon them, which makes them realize the sin they're in. And then they repent and they come back to the Lord. And so the evil was turned into a good in a way. In the same way we saw like with David, right? Um, the plague that came upon Israel caused David to then repent. And through that, he got, um, he managed to um, buy Mount Moriah, which is where they would then build the temple. And so, so Elijah prayed that prayer. He comes back to Israel, and that is when God tells him to make this contest um, against the prophets of Baal. And it could have been anything. It didn't have to be, oh, you set up your altar, I set up my altar, and um, I bring my bull and you bring your bull. And actually, Sister White goes into a bit more detail that the altar that Elijah set up was actually like an old altar that had previously been set up when Israel was in obedience. But since it fell into disobedience, the altar had been just like uh, become some old, like, you know, just forgotten about. And so it was the burnt sacrifice that God chose to show this mighty power um, this day in front of the eyes of all Israel. And so, you know, like I said, like I was saying, it could have been anything that God chose to, sh to show that day, but he chose this for a reason. And of course, we know it's because the burnt sacrifice represented the fact that the future Messiah would come and die for the sins of the world. He would give himself as an offering so that we can all be saved by his blood. So not only was um, Elijah calling people back to the Lord God through the miracle, he was calling them back to the Lord God and the gospel message that you can't be saved by none other, but by Christ, by the gospel. And so. Yeah, and of course, so of course, the fire fell down from heaven, and um, 
you know, we know that what happened down here in First Kings chapter 18 has been a massive thorn in the side of Satan ever since. And if you read Revelation, you will see, you will see that that makes sense, right? Because in Revelation, it says that when Satan appears as Jesus, which he will in our day, God will allow him to do something that, um, that he, you know, basically send fire down from heaven. So Satan's going to send fire down from heaven when he comes as Christ. Um, and God will allow him at that point to do it. He obviously didn't allow him to do it here. But this has been obviously a fallen inside ever since, because that's one thing that he will do when he comes as Christ. And of course, many people, when they see something like that, will just bow down and worship Satan. But we will know not to do that because we've been in the study of the scriptures. If someone comes to us and says, well, did you see what happened on the TV? Or did you see the fire that came down from heaven? Because maybe it will be apparent to the majority of people on the planet anyway, without watching the television, who knows? And they'll say, well, did you see that? And, you know, we know what to do. We know that Satan doing it because it's already told us in the Bible. So, and then we see in Judges chapter 6, verses 21 to 24, another occasion where the burnt offering was um, brought about. And this time, of course, it's the story of um, Gideon, who was another judge, like last week we looked at Samson. So it's the same thing with Gideon. He was actually about, he was before Samson, maybe by 100, 150 years or so maybe 200. And so um, at this time, they'd been in bondage to the Midianites for quite some time, around full, no, I can't remember how long, but they were, they were in bondage for a long time. And at this point, God is now about to send a deliverer in the form of Gideon. And so we see in verse 21, it says, then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, talking about Gideon's hand, and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. So here, like we saw last week, is another scripture where the angel of the Lord is literally called God, because Gideon calls him O Lord God. And then it says, the angel of the Lord actually talks to Gideon and in verse 23 and says, and the Lord said unto him, so the angel of the Lord is being called Lord here, peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day, it is yet in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. So Gideon builds an altar, calls it Jehovah Shalom, which I mean, which I believe means um, God is peace. And then going on in verses 25 to 28, it says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God, and upon the top of the his, this rock, in the ordered place, and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove, which grove, which thou shalt cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. And so it was, because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Basically, because if he did it in the daytime, they would have just seen him and probably killed him in sight. So it was actually quite wise that he waited till nighttime. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. So here we see Gideon takes down the idols and places the gospel message there instead through the burnt offering. And we know what happens next in the story, right? That Gideon and his army, which originally was about 30,000 men, it was whittled down to 300. 300 who were actually serious, because if you remember, the test was. Um, to well the first thing he said those that were were afraid send them home so he sent home about i think a few thousand of them and then there was like twenty three thousand left then he said take them down to the waters and whoever would like drink of the waters with their hands and let go of their weapons tell them to go home and there were only 300 that they lapped the water like dogs whilst having their hand on their sword so that even if the enemy was to come upon them at that point, like behind them, they could quickly go and like, you know, smite them, smite the enemy. 
So it was only those that had the hand on the sword that the Lord decided to choose. And it's the same in these days. The Lord's army would be built up of those who always have their hand on the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And you don't put that word down and you study it daily. And of course, so just before this great deliverance, the Lord reminded Gideon of the gospel message through the burnt offering. And of course, in today's world, like I said, we have to cast down all the idols that this world has, um, whether it be Christians or even unbelievers, because there are many idols in this world today. Today, it might not be like in Gideon's day, where it's an, you know, a statue of Baal or whatever false god, but um, it might be you know, pleasure, uh, false theories that you know, like evolution and false doctrine as well that are that abounds in the churches, and um, can't think of other ones off the top of my head but there are many idols in today's world that need to be cut down and the cross of christ needs to be placed there instead and so in romans chapter 12 so now we've looked at like some examples in the old testament where the burnt offering was had taken place and now what we're going to do is this we're going to take a look at how in the new testament um the burnt offering can be applied into our lives and how we can be a sacrifice to God. So in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So our reasonable service is to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 10 to 11, we read, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. And in Amos 5.22, it says, Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. The reason for this was because as the Jewish nation became, went more and more into apostasy, they were making these burnt offerings and these sacrificial offerings that the Lord had commanded, but they weren't doing the works that went along with that. So they were, in a sense, they were claiming to believe the gospel, but they weren't given their lives as a sacrifice. You know, the animal sacrifice was just a symbol of their faith in the message that there will be a future Messiah to die for the sins of the world. But if they didn't act in accordance with that profession, then the Lord tells us here what he thinks of them. I will not accept them. So in Amos 5.22, it's the same thing as when Jesus said in that day, many will call me Lord, Lord, and I will say I never knew you. Because it's like if you claim to be a Christian or even if you make some kind of sacrifice in your life, you go out and preach, um, you know, you think that you're casting out devils, you're praying for people, you're spending hours in prayer, hours in the Bible. But the Bible clearly says to keep the commandments, including commandment number four, to keep the Sabbath day holy. But that person refuses to keep the Sabbath day, even after the light has been shone upon their path. All their praying, all their preaching will, will come to naught. They'll end up in the fires of hell um, and will be turned into ashes because they didn't actually obey God's word. And I put this verses later on in the study, but it's in First Samuel chapter 15, I believe, when Samuel is talking to Saul and he says to him um, that um, obedience is better than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. You know, you can claim to be a Christian, but you have to walk the walk. You have to show your faith by your works. And so in Mark chapter 12, verses 41 to 44, we see an example of a person who was given a true offering unto God. And of course, that is the poor widow. So in verse 41, it says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow have cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, 
even all her living. So this example of faith has actually been recorded in the scriptures for all eternity for us to read about. Um, because, you know, this woman, she literally gave everything to the treasury and Jesus saw that as a good offering. And of course, we know as Christians that we are to give the tithe and we are to give offerings unto God. Now, the Pharisees, they were doing that. But when it came to giving their tithe and their offerings, it looked like they were giving a lot. But they actually weren't giving a lot because they were, you know, they were super rich. So, you know, imagine you're a millionaire and you give £10,000 in an offering. That's not a lot. But if you did it out in the open to everyone and they didn't, you know, they would just look like a lot, right? But you could be like this poor widow and have like, you know, just a couple of quid to, you know, to put together. And you give two quid, it doesn't look like a lot, but God knows the heart. He knows where, you know, the heart of the people, where the offering is coming from. And it's the same with us. No matter how much we have or how little we have, he'll know if we're giving a true offering unto him. Um with our lives, with our money, and what, with whatever he's given us. And so in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 38, we read, Beside the Sabbath of the Lord, and beside your gifts, and beside all your vows, and beside all your free will offerings, which ye give unto the Lord. So we see in the Bible that the tithe, of course, is a 10% of um, the of your of overall our increase, which we give to the Lord, right? And if you remember in the study of when we did the study of the priests before, we saw how Paul compared them giving the tithes to the priests in the Old Testament dispensation to us in the New Testament dispensation, giving a tenth of our increase to those that are commissioned to preach the gospel. So pastors. Um, oh, well, it was, yeah, back it was the priests and the Levites. So it was pastors or people doing um, the gospel work full time. Right. And so. Um, da, da, da. Yeah, so here we see we're still to give these free will offerings. And in 1 Corinthians 16, chapter, verse 3, we see an example of that where Paul says, And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. So the liberality was a free will offering that was separate from the tithe that the church in Corinth was given to the church in Jerusalem. Because, of course, the church in Jerusalem was heavily persecuted by the Jews. And many of the Christians there were former Jews who had lost pretty much everything. So the rest of the church needed to come together and give free will offerings for those in um, Jerusalem. And um, the gifts, which is also um, offerings, besides, you know, besides the tithe, are, is also, Paul ma also makes mention of that in Philippians chapter four, verses 15 to 18, where it says, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you an odour of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So here we see that the church um, in da, 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 Philippi, yeah, the church in Philippi was sending Paul money to help him with his efforts in sharing the gospel. And he even says that it wasn't because I decided to give. Like, he wasn't like he was asking them. They just gave it. But, um, oh, wait. When I depart from the church, communicate with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Um, no church. So no other church was giving to him at that point, but I, I believe is what it's saying there in verse 15. But the church in Philippi did, and he was saying that he desired to see fruit that may abound to their account. So in Paul's eyes, it was more important that he knew the blessings that they would receive from giving freely to the Lord and the work that was going forward than actually him using the money to do the work or them giving him the money in the first place. So um, because he says, I have all and abound, I am full. And then he says, uh, this is interesting in verse 18, where he, he says it's an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God, because he's using the same language that we see in Leviticus 113 when talking about the burnt offering, where it says, but he shall wash the inwards and the legs with water 
and the priest shall bring it all and burn it upon the altar. It is a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savour unto the Lord, or a sweet savour, sweet smell. And so Paul tells us in, the, in our time, in the New Testament dispensation, that giving offerings to God is as an odour of a sweet smell. And if you remember, part of the burnt offering in the Old Testament time was the fact that you would actually it would actually cost you a lot of money to procure the animal in the first place, whether it be a bull or a lamb or a goat. And so just in that, you were you were showing your faith basically by the, your by actually buying the animal and then sacrificing it. You you trusted in the gospel message, right? And it would and so that's why even last week, if you remember with David, all down the Jebusite, he was willing to give the mountain and the threshing floor to David for free. He just say he was like, just take it. Because you remember he was kind of scared because he just saw the angel of the Lord. And so then David said to him, No, 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 I can't offer a burnt sacrifice without paying for it. Because that was part of it, of the offering itself. And even as Christians today, we know that we are commissioned to give tithe and offering to God. And in Acts chapter 4, verses 36 to 37, we see an example from the early church of how they were when it came to giving, not tithes, because like we've gone over that, we know about tithes, but offerings. So it says, and Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And Sister White talks about what was going on here in the early church in Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 3, page 283, paragraph 2, where she says, This was the effect of the pouring out of the Spirit of God upon the believers. It made them of one heart and soul. They had one common interest, the success of the mission entrusted to them. Their love for their brethren and the cause with which they espoused was far greater than their love for money and possessions. They acted out their faith and by their works testified that they accounted the souls of men of far greater value than any earthly heritage. And she goes on to say, when it becomes apparent that the spirit of truth weakens the affections of its disciples from the world and renders them self-sacrificing and benevolent in order to save their fellow men, the advocates of the truth will have a powerful influence upon their hearers. And of course, that was the case with the apostles. They were willing to literally give everything, like Barnabas, into the cause of God. And it wasn't like he then had nothing, because the rest of the church, they were all, they had all things in common, as we read in Acts. So they would look after each other, basically. But when it came to money, it was all about building up the church, building up the gospel work on the earth. And David had that same heart as we see in the Old Testament. And then in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35, it reads, And the multitudes of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So, and of course we know, right, because Sister White says here that um, when... When the advocates of truth take their faith so seriously and take this truth so seriously to the point where they're willing to give everything for it, including their, their, you know, the, the financial blessings that the Lord gives them, then they will have a powerful influence upon their hearers. And of course, we see what happened in Acts. Great power gave the apostles, with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And, as, and I'm not saying no. I'm not saying um, go and give all your money in a um, tithe and offering. No. Um, of course, you give your 10%. And then when it comes to the offerings, it's a case of, you know, how much do you have to give to the Lord? You know, either in offering to someone who is doing the work, um, which would be a pastor, a full-time minister, 
So not someone like myself who's like just a brother or in the faith, right? So it would be like um, a case of, you know, you, you make sure you pay your rent, you do, do, have enough to eat and whatever for the month. And then with whatever you have left over, that's up to you how much you want to give to the Lord. But we can see from the examples in scripture of God's obedient people, they gave a lot. They gave a lot. Because they really believed that this was the truth. And so they knew that. Um, what Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 21 it says lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal for where your treasure is there will your heart be also so you know if you're if your mind is set on heaven, you won't really care about the, the what this world has to offer in terms of possessions, in terms of money. And um, and it's okay to have money. It's okay to have a lot of money. But understand that if you have that money, it's the main reason for you having that money is the Lord is testing you whether you're going to put that money into the work, whether you're going to give that money in tithes and offerings. I didn't put Malachi chapter 4 in here. I believe it's chapter 4. But if you remember from before, where in Malachi, God says you can literally prove him with tithes and offerings. That basically, the more you're willing to give, the more with a free heart, not a heart of, oh, yeah, no, I'll give it because I have to. No, you give it with a free heart. You will see that he will bless you back either with more finances to do the work or with um, it doesn't have to be in that case. It could be spiritual. It could be opening up the word more to you, um, sending more souls your way to preach the truth to you. Um, when you go out and share the gospel. And so in Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, it says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? So of course, Jesus Christ, he told us, to, he told us this as his disciples, so that he's like, don't worry about things in terms of like having a roof over your head and food to eat and all this stuff because god's just gonna he's gonna provide that he just does that all our duty is to obey and the rest falls into place and of course you can always go out into nature and like i do like go out and uh, We'll give him a minute because I think his connection dropped. Um, when I heard it, it went robotic. So, I'll give it. Build up the temple. And so, in First Chronicles chapter 29, verses 3 to 5, we read, and I will go a little bit over, but not too much. Um, so, it says, moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, even 3,000 talents of gold of the gold of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver, to overlay the walls of the houses withal, the gold for the things of gold, and the silver for the things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? So essentially, David saying, this is what I've given to build up the temple. I've given 3,000 talents of gold. And by the way, a talent, one talent of gold in today's money is like one and a half million dollars or a million pounds, roughly. So one talent is a million pounds. So 3,000 talents of gold, that's about three billion pounds, I believe, in today's money, if I'm getting the mass right. So it's a lot of money. And of course, 
So it's like God had blessed David with a lot, right? Because remember, at one point, he was a poor shepherd boy. At one point, he, had, he was homeless, going from cave to cave, whilst his life was being, whilst he was being tracked down by Saul, who was trying to kill him for many years. But it came to the point where David was blessed with this stuff, and it was a test on, for David, as we shall see, as to whether he was going to use this stuff to build up the temple of the Lord before his death. And so David does, and then he says to the rest of the congregation, what are you willing to give to the service of the Lord this day? And then in verse 6 to 9, we read, Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with their rulers of the king's work offered willingly and gave for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams and of silver 10,000 talents and of brass 18,000 talents and 100,000 talents of iron. And they with whom precious stones were found gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. So in our day, um, you know, we have a temple to build up, if you like, which is God's work in this, in this earth, which is, um, you know, the, the gospel in these last days, sharing the free angels message, warning people about the mark, right? And um, part of that, is, of course, is giving the offerings unto God, as we see here in the Old Testament. And then in verse 12 to 17, we read, so this is after they've all given their offerings. And now David is actually praying to God and praying slash praising him in these verses here. So David says, and he's talking to God here, both riches and honor come of thee and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and of thine own have we given thee. So in other words, God gave them all that gold and silver anyway, and they're just giving it back to him. For we are strangers before thee and sojourners as were all our fathers. Our days on the earth are as a shadow and there is none abiding. Our Lord, our O oh Lord, our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee in house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. I know also, my God, that thou triest the heart and hast pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of mine heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now I have seen with joy thy people which are present here to offer willingly unto thee. So, how did God try David's heart? By giving him these riches to see whether he's going to give the riches back to him in building up the temple, right? And it's the same for us today. As God will increase and bless us, he's going to test us to see how much we're going to give back to him in the service of the gospel, in tithe and offering, and, and you know, whether it be buying gospel tracts to share with the multitudes out there and what have you. And so in verse 18, it says, Oh, so David still speak, praying. He's saying, Oh, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. So basically, David prays there that God would keep what just happened here with all the people giving their offerings towards the temple service in the thoughts and the imaginations of his people forever so that we can meditate on these things and we can see that in the old testament they were willing to give a lot well throughout the bible um and so that's um something that we can learn from essentially and then i'll just finish with this from it's from first testimonies page 85 paragraph two and so i reason why i put this in here is because i thought it was a good example of the kind of um offering that the people of God gave back in the 1800s, so in Sister White's time. Because if you read the early, uh, how things went down with the Seventh-day Adventist church when it first came about, like the early pioneers before the church fell, it was literally like a few people, like like a handful of people. It was not a lot, of, not a lot at, all, at, at all. And even when Ellen White was receiving her first visions, I saw her, I was reading her writings this morning, she was saying how like, 
it was literally like a few people that were coming and were listening to her and her husband preach at their home like at that time they were so broke like they didn't have churches they were like preaching from their houses at that point and then as they continue as they gave more into the work the lord like blessed them and grew the work and then of course they ended up going completely into apostasy and sister white prophesied that but anyway so we see here um, um sister white says we were invited to meet with the brethren in the state of new york the following summer the believers were poor and could not promise to do much toward defraying our expenses we had no means with which to travel my husband's health was poor but the way opened for him to work in the hayfield and he decided to make the effort it seemed then that we must live by faith when we arose in the morning we bowed at our bedside and asked god to give us strength to labor through the day we would not be satisfied unless we had the assurance that the lord heard us pray my husband then went forth to sing swing the scythe not in his own strength but in the strength of the lord at night when he came home we would again plead with god for strength to earn means to spread his truth we were often greatly blessed so again um god they were praying that god would give them work to earn more money so that that actually that money could then go to spread his truth which is exactly how we saw how, how it was with god's people in the bible and then she goes on to say in a letter to brother howland july 1848 my husband that's james white wrote god gives me strength to labor hard all day praise his name i hope to get a few dollars to use in his cause we have suffered from labor fatigue pain hunger cold and heat while endeavoring to do our brethren and sisters good and we hold ourselves ready to suffer more if god requires i rejoice today that ease pleasure and comfort in this life are a sacrifice on the altar of my faith and hope so linking it back to the burnt sacrifice um if our happiness consists in making others happy we are happy indeed the true disciple will not live to gratify beloved self but for christ and for the good of his little ones he is to sacrifice his ease his pleasure his comfort his convenience his will and his own selfish wishes for christ's cause or never reign with him on his throne so i hope and pray that you were blessed by what was heard this sabbath day um brother gideon will present what the lord has him to preach Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that He is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him.
Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. Amen. Sabbath blessings, everyone. Um, yeah, I really picked two songs, but I had no idea I did that. Um, so first of all, I won't need to share my screen today because really we're only going to need the chat. Um, if anything, if you have a NIV, ESV or NASB, you can, uh, for this week only, you can open that up to the side um, as we go through all of these. Um, before we kick off, there was a testimony that I forgot to share on Testimony Sabbath. I was bad on my part. But this is from Sister Marie, not Sister Anne Marie, the other one. It says, Hey Gideon, I just wanted to share something the Lord did for me. I moved house to, I don't want to say the area, I want to keep it anonymous. I moved house to, let's say, house B. And my brothers needed to apply to new schools. So my dad asked me to send him the relevant application forms to print out. And he was going to print, and he was going to print them out at work since we didn't have any internet in the house for our printer to work. It turns out that I didn't send him all the relevant applications, probably due to neglect, um, which I, now I don't think you would need to repent of that. Sounds like you forgot, but they said which I repented of. And I knew that if I told him, he was going to get very, very annoyed. So I tried to see if there was any way at all I could print out the papers using the data on my phone. It wasn't possible since I didn't have the right cable to connect my phone to the printer. So I just remember sitting at the printer, literally about to cry because he told me he was going to send the papers to the schools in person the next day. And I remember begging the Lord to help me because I knew what my dad's reaction was going to be. And I told myself, let me try again. After trying for about 45 minutes, and as soon as I turned the print on again, all the relevant print papers started printing, despite the fact that my printer wasn't connected to anything at all. And this just shows how the Lord helped me to avoid disaster. Wow. <laughs> that, that, that is amazing. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> print, papers started printing without being connected. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad I shared that. I'm glad that I went. By the way, this is my first time reading this as well. I received it, but I forgot to add it to the notes. But hey, maybe it's maybe it was just for today. Maybe it was meant to be put to exactly this moment. So, yeah, you know, the Lord can have papers printing, even not connected. So praise the Lord for that. Um, he helps us in anything big or small. And I am I am 100% sure in that moment in time, it was very big, <laughs> but small for him. So, apart from that blessing, let's begin with the uh, second and final part of the Vatican corruption. So just as a heads up, on the Plucked Out website, soon I will be uploading a new section 
and it's going to be called the Vatican Corruption. So we'll have where what manuscripts is the King James um, version predominantly based on? The differences in the New Testament. There'll be a section on some differences in the old. Today we're going to look at the new, mainly, um, no, pretty much all of it. And uh, in the f- in near future, in the future, we'll also have a section which shows all the um, places that the Apocrypha is not inspired by God in any way, shape or form. Historical errors and just errors in doctrine against the Bible. And is the reason why we don't read it, but the Catholics read it. Um, and that's one thing you'll notice, that people tend to pick up the Ap- Apocrypha when it agrees with what they want to leave. And all the parts which disagree with the Bible, they'll just ignore. So we're going to have all of that. There's going to be a whole section called the Vatican Corruption. Why? Because they're spearheading all of it. (laughs) So let's begin. I said to everyone here, and I I called someone uh, a jack of all trades. I said, oh, wow, you're a jack of all trades. Would you, just hearing that alone, let me know in the chat. Would you think um, that's a positive sentiment? Negative sentiment from the way I've said it. Oh, he's a jack of all trades. Does it sound positive or negative? It's based on those words alone. I'm not going any further than that. Sounds kind of positive, right? Correct. Now, if I add a bit more of the phrase where it's said to mean a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Ah, he's a jack of all trades, but he's a master of none. Now, does that sound positive or negative? Now that I've added that extra little bit, now it sounds a bit more negative, right? All right. Now, some people claim that this is the full quote, but I'm doubling back on that because I haven't found evidence for that. But some people claim that the full quote is a jack of all trades, master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. Now, does that sound positive or negative again? So a jack of all trades, master of none, but oftentimes better than a master of one. Positive or negative? Which one are we going for there? Several people. Uh, now it sounds more positive, right? Now it's like you're saying, oh uh, yeah, although you don't, you don't, you're not a master in any specific um, area, um, the fact that you have so much knowledge in all of these areas is better than you specializing in one. You see how just by adding certain words or removing certain words, the meaning of what I'm saying changes, can change very drastically. Someone hearing someone call someone a jack of all trades, oh yeah, he's being nice to him. Someone hearing someone say, yeah, he's a jack of all trades, but master of none. Now it sounds negative. Jack of all trades, master of none, oftentimes better than a master of one. Now it sounds positive again. Applying that, to the Bible, where we saw how Satan took words out of Psalms 91, saying to Jesus, oh yeah, you know, jump off the height of the the pinnacle of the temple. And it's written that his angels will um, bear thee up in their arms, right? And lest you dash your foot against a stone. But he left out the pit where it says to keep thee in all thy ways. So just by removing those little scriptures, it has a different meaning and you draw a different conclusion based on what you've heard. Now, if you consistently read the Bible with all of these bits added or missing, do you think you're going to arrive at the doctrine that the Lord wants you to arrive at? You will arrive. Actually, no, you, you run into a lot of errors. Let's put this into perspective. The King James has, like something like 783,000 words in it. And looking at the NIV, which tends to be the most popular version next to it, it has 730, let me see, it's about 50 something thousand now, roughly about 730 something thousand words. So the NIV has 55,000 words less than the KJV. Put that into perspective. If you add Genesis, in Leviticus, you would get 50,000 words in total. 
So the ed, the difference in word count, even between the NIV and the KJV, is more than fifty thousand words. It's a Genesis and a Leviticus book combined. So now we don't. I'm not even going to use that as the final um, say, right? Because although that may be indicative of corruption. I won't use word count alone because, you know, maybe you can get two sentences that mean the same different lengths of words. Cool. So let's analyze it down to the core. Let's begin. Scripture number one. In Matthew 17, and actually, can you post the NIV version, Gabriel? I'll post the KJV, you post the NIV. And then, yeah. No, I won't need to share screen because we're just going through scripture upon scripture. So in Matthew 17, after actually, after we go through the um, the ones that are removed, then we can get into some of the ones that um, they've changed them. So maybe I can show the document, actually. That would be good. It's just like a table, to be honest. So Matthew 17, 21. Oh, do you have the NIV version? Yeah. Jesus said, How be it, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. In the NIV, this is removed. Now, some of us, we've seen this one before. What was Jesus talking about here? What was this kind? You're speaking of demons. There are certain demons that unless you pray and fast, you're not going to be able to cast them out. Who do you think benefits from you not knowing that knowledge? Is it the kingdom of the Lord or is it the kingdom of Satan? Obviously the demons themselves, in fact, because I don't want to go through everyone, um, I think even in the ESV, let me see, because I'm sure in the ESV they remove it as well. Hold up. Matthew 17, 20 ESV. Ah. Yeah, so in the ESV, it doesn't even come up because they've removed it. And in the NASB, uh, let's see, have they removed it? Yeah, they, they've probably removed it as well. NASB, um, if I do 20, yeah, so the NASB has removed it. So just to understand, so this bot, what the Bible bot will do is... If they've removed the verse, it won't post or say anything, but it seems for the NIV, it posts a blank. So we'll use the NIV for now. All right. So the other scripture is, oops, sorry, let me scroll down. Matthew eighteen eleven. So in Matthew eighteen eleven, it says this, for the son of man is come to save that which is lost. In the NIV, nothing. So who, who, why, why was this scripture removed? Well, it was clear when Jesus came to the earth, his mission was to save all that were lost, right? God so loved the world that he gave um, his only begotten son. But mm, the NIV just removes this because why? Mm, Satan doesn't want people to know that. This is going to be a bit of a blitz. Matthew 23, 14. In the King James Version, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! Ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So, in other words, what is Jesus condemning here? Hypocrisy. When in, um, let's say, in secret, you exact, or, and this is when um, they were exacting things on the widows that they couldn't, you know, afford like laying on them burdens that they just couldn't supply. So that's what Jesus meant by they devour widows' houses and for a pretense make a long prayer. So they're doing it under the guise of um, religion. So they're doing something evil under the guise of religion and that's going to cause them to receive the greater damnation. That's like when the Catholic Church say, oh yeah, we're going to go for a holy war against, um, uh, against I don't know, the Muslims, but they didn't just crusade against Muslims, by the way. There were some Christians also suffered by the crusades as well. They, they didn't really care. As long as it benefited them, it was a crusade. 
or crusaders would pillage um villages they didn't really care about which would have some christians inside uh, or christians that didn't agree with them and obviously in matthew 23 verse 14 that verse is removed and then mark 7 verse 16 what does it say? If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. In the NIV, it's blank. If blank, blankety blank, blank, blank. Now, in what universe does it make sense to remove something like this? There is nothing, we, so there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him those are the things that defile the man. Essentially, your heart, that which is inside of you, your mind. But what a lot of new Bibles do is that they try to say that, oh, he was saying unclean food is clean now. So when Jesus concludes by saying in Mark 7, 16, that if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Basically, if you actually understand what I'm saying, then, you know, you'll get the point that I'm trying to make. Obviously, they just removed that because... They try to remove the fact that there's a deeper meaning to what Jesus say, said in terms of there's nothing entering into you that can defile you. Basically, if somebody is a murderer, it doesn't make you a murderer. If somebody is sinning, that's not what makes you the sinner. You become a sinner of your own volition, that which is in your mind and in your heart and what you want to do. So there's no, no, there's no one, you cannot blame a sin on anyone outside of yourself. Because no one can come and inject a will to sin within you. That comes from within. So you need to clean, well, you can't. You need Christ to clean you from within so that that which comes out of you will only be pure. So let us move on. Mark 9 44. There's another one like this, but Mark 9 44. When speaking of the um, everlasting fire, right, this makes it seem like it's a fire that can be quenched if you ignore that part. I'll just post more of the verse. So, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off, for it is better to enter into life maimed than having two hands, going, uh, two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So here, Mark 9.44 is explaining that it's the fire that can't be quenched. It's not saying that they will be eternally burning. It's just trying to say that the type of fire that people will be burning in will be a fire that they cannot put out themselves. Why does their worm continue to live? Because that worm is going to be part of the new earth. In fact, in Isaiah 66, let me see if I can pull up the scripture. I think I remember it. Hold on. Is Isaiah 66? If I've got it wrong, I'll just go find it. Ah, here we go. This is speaking about us who are inside the city of New Jerusalem. And as we go outside of the city and we see all the people burnt up by the lake of fire, this is what we see. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed me. Their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Hang on a minute. So are we going to go out and hear um, people screaming? No, it says they're carcasses. They're dead. They're burnt up. Ash. So the reason the worm isn't dying is because the worm is crawling of their dead body. Why won't their fire be quenched? Because they can't put out that fire that's burning them. Or burnt them at this point. So by referencing Mark 9.44 actually is meant to lead you to Isaiah 66.24. Which clearly shows you that they won't continually be burning. But if you remove um, Mark 9.44, then it's a case of, oh, it's not speaking about Isaiah 66.24. So this fire is speaking about something else. This is different to Isaiah 66.24. But no. We will actually see the ashes and the dead bodies of the people, which God is going to wipe away and make new and clean and remake the whole earth. And it's actually, I won't touch on that tangent, but let's go into another scripture. 
in Mark 11, 26. Now, this is interesting. I feel like Gabriel knows which ones I'm going to. In Mark eleven twenty six, it says, But if ye do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. NIV removed. Now, guys, do you really think that Jesus didn't say that? Do you really think that, that was not meant to be in the Bible? If you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive you of your trespasses. By removing that, it makes it seem like, oh no, you can hold hatred or you can leave people unforgiven. No, should I say, yeah, unforgiven. You don't have to forgive people and you can receive forgiveness. No, as Christians, we have to forgive people so that we can be forgiven. And Jesus even gives a parable to this. I think it's in Luke 16. I think it's the first part of Luke 16. It may not be Luke's, uh, the first part of Luke 16, but the one man who owed two talents versus the man who owed 10,000. And the one that owed 10,000 to the Lord, or king, if you, or the Lord, I'll say the Lord. I think he used the word Lord in that passage. He couldn't pay, but yet he wanted to throw in prison some guy who owed him two talents. And obviously from that story, we're like, that's unjust. And we know for ourselves that, yeah, if we're, what sin has anyone committed against us that is worse than what we've done to the Father? Well, what sin can we think of? Because whatever someone owes to us, we owe more to the Father. And if the Father's going to forgive us, like him, we should forgive others. If he can forgive us of everything, even murder, we need to forgive. And it's interesting, right? Because if you search Matthew, let me see. If you search Matthew 18, 35, NIV, it actually comes up. So why would you remove something if it's, it defeats the whole point? Let me also see if they've added a footnote, because sometimes they add footnotes. Um, let me double check, NIV, yeah, so this is the funny thing I'm going to also touch on as well. So the NIV, or those other Bibles which are based off the critical text, they will remove these verses and say, oh, they weren't found in the early manuscripts, even though they're found in the majority of manuscripts, right? And they're, these scriptures are quoted throughout time before some of these manuscripts. Even though there's clear evidence that that verse should be there, you will find the same verse in another gospel. So maybe they'll remove one verse from one gospel, but then that verse is still there in another gospel. So it's like, hang on a minute. Why would you say this wasn't meant to be there when another gospel shows it to be there? Not only that, other manuscripts show it to be there and the King James has it there. Is it possible that the manuscript that you're working off of, you know, the Vaticanus, the Sinaiticus, which is what the Vatican, um, uh, what's the word, push forward? Is it possible that those manuscripts are just dodgy? Nah, they don't want to go with that. So, yeah, apparently Jesus did say this, but they're just trying to say, eh, but Mark never wrote that. Which is inconsistent. Very, very inconsistent. So even in the scriptures they try to remove, you'll find it in another part, maybe in another gospel. And now, this is another interesting mark, Mark 15, 28. Yeah, they'll do that. Mark 15, 28. The scripture was fulfilled, which said he was numbered with the transgressors. Okay, so why are they removing fulfillment of prophecy? Why would you do that? To hide him as Messiah. And you'll also notice throughout the NIV, there are certain places where they remove Jesus, they remove Christ from the name of Jesus. Like, it's very inconsistent. 
and whilst we have all of the books today so it's easy to see through it imagine if i don't know you are receiving a letter and you're the church of thessalonians and today you're receiving a letter from paul and somebody's taking out christ and now people want to challenge on who christ is it can cause problems so that is why every word is important and crucial but and mark 16 now i'm not going to post the whole one um but mark 16 9 to 20 what they do is they've removed that whole section or they've now put in italics and they've said that that section wasn't there let me see if they keep it or they italicize it in the niv yes so as you can see at the beginning it says the earliest manuscripts and some other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 to 20 that is a lie whenever they say the earliest manuscripts they're talking like a couple that the vatican have so when you see earliest manuscripts is code word for the vaticanus and sinaticus when they say other ancient witnesses they're talking about a couple papyri so when i mean a couple papyri is like okay let's say you'll have let's say the vaticanus and sinaticus which maybe have this removed and then you'll have like two or three papyruses which also have it removed but then you'll have a whole bunch of manuscripts which have it there do you see what i mean so when they say some other ancient witnesses they're not talking about 1000 manuscripts no they're talking like three but they know no one's gonna go and check that oh uh, who are these eight other ancient witnesses and we're actually going to see that they don't even hold to this standard um, as well in another verse I'm going to bring up. But just to whiz through this. So when they say some ancient manuscripts or the earliest manuscripts, they're just hoping that most people aren't going to bother check, um, checking. Because really, at the end, it comes down to like three, like two, two codexes and some papyri. But even those codexes disagree with each other. And the papyri, I think that's the plural of papyrus. I think it's papyruses, actually. Is it papyrus? Is it papyruses? Let me, let me double check. Papyruses. No, I think it's... Pap yeah, it's papyruses. Yeah, it's a noun. Yeah, yeah. Papyruses, sorry. So... It's not like we're talking hundreds upon hundreds of manuscripts. It's mainly based on a few papyruses, which come from typically Alexandria, where there was already a corruption of manuscripts. But in other places, it can also be... Oh, that's interesting. But in other places, they don't have these corruptions. So, what else do we have? Um, I actually want to go on to John 5, 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after troubling the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. The NIV just removed this. Why? The thing is, it actually destroys the context as well if you remove it. Because in John chapter 5, let's take 3 to 7, right? You can see that the man came to that water. So if you remove this verse, you then beg the question, why would the man come to the water then if it does nothing? So John chapter 5 verse 4 is explaining because an angel went down to the pool to trouble the water. But then in the NIV it says, here a great number of disabled people used to lie to the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition, he asked him, um, do you want to get well? Sorry, I'm skipping some bits where it says, sir, the invalid replied, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. Is that okay? Who stirred the water? Why is he trying to get into the pool? Taking this out, it just makes it look like, oh, this guy wants to go into the pool for just, I don't know, 
skinny dip or um he just wants to go swimming <laughs> why why would he want to do that why would disabled people want to be um near a random pool it does not make sense but john chapter 5 verse 4 adds the context that pool allowed for a miracle at a certain time of the year so it shows how desperate he was to reach that miracle to reach that healing take that out it's just random So, John chapter 7, verse 53 to John 8, 11, takes out the story of the adulterous woman. Um, a whole section is concluded where Jesus says, go and sin no more. And they try to fight this tooth and nail. And the funny thing is, you have people before it, people quoting that before these manuscripts even come to existence. So you have people who even the Catholic Church call quote unquote church fathers that they're quoting this scripture. So it was clearly there in existence. John chapter 7. So the NIV erases John chapter 7 53 to John 8 11. Ah. Let me do this. John 7 53 to 8 11. Okay, so that's the KJV, and the, the NIV says this. Oh, you're going to post the NIV? Okay, you post the NIV. This is the story of the adulterous woman, and then what they add is the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses. Now they've added the word many because there were a few more um <laughs> there were a few more manuscripts which had this missing but now they say many other w ancient witnesses do not have it but the funny thing is yeah it's very sly but the funny thing here is this story is quoted by their own quote unquote church fathers as in meaning all of those guys that they hold to as being church fathers quote from this and have this in their own writings. So it proves that this existed before um, their supposed Vaticanus Codex. This would be equivalent to somebody saying, oh, um, the, uh, I don't know, the BBC never wrote on this story. Meanwhile, you, f you find a correspondent who works at the BBC talking about that story writing about that story so it's like saying oh this event never happened but then you find a correspondent of that same company writing about it quoting the verse so it's very interesting that even this story which is completely is quoted throughout history they just ignore it so rather it would be evidence that those manuscripts would be corruptions because if everybody is quoting using this scripture, then the scripture must exist. Also, it means you would have to conclude that the original reading, right? Leave your sin, yeah, is not as cutting as go and sin no more. Watch this. So what they're trying to say is that John chapter 5, 752 went directly into John 8, 12. They're trying to say this was meant to read. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also a prophet of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Think about that for a moment, guys. Does that make sense? Who is Jesus speaking to? What do you mean, spake unto them again? Where does this begin? Because what they're trying to say is that John chapter 7, 52, and just for context, John 7, 50 to 52. It's when they were, um, they were at the Feast of Tabernacles and Nicodemus was defending Jesus. Jesus is not here. This is the Pharisees and the, and the officers and the um, 
scribes speaking to one another. So Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our Lord judge any man before it heareth him, and know what he know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And what they're trying to say is that that leads directly into, into this. Then Jesus spake again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Thy record is not true. Jesus wasn't with them. In John chapter 7 verse 50 to 52. But really, in John chapter 8, verse 1, what we see is there's a new section. So they are trying to remove that section, the story of the adulterous woman, because Jesus explicitly said to that woman, go and sin no more, which means that she cannot live in sin. This would destroy the idea of being saved in your sins rather than being saved from your sins because it was very blunt what jesus said we all look at the grace that jesus gave to the woman but then we ignore what he said at the end where he says go and sin no more he didn't leave the condemnation to be like yeah carry on your life no it was go and sin no more that was the command given And also, you know what, uh, let me go to the most egregious one, 1 John 5, 7. So there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now, the NIV have removed it. <laughs> The ESV has also removed it. Now, for those of you that are, for there are three that testify. Okay. So for those of you that are wondering, why is this so, um, <laughs> just curious, why is this so important? Because this verse locks down that the Father, Word, and Holy Ghost are three separate entities. That is three gods in the Godhead. Now, people get confused. They say, hang on a minute. It says these three are one. The word one can also mean united. So that it's not my interpretation, let's see what Jesus means by the word one. As you know, there may be babes in Christ or you never know. Um, a lot of people are taught that it's one essence and God is one and is like, no. The Father is one God. The Son is one God. The Holy Spirit is one God. One plus one plus one is three. John 17 verse 11 says, and now I am no more in the world speaking, Jesus speaking, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou, you, have given me, that they may be one as we are. Is Jesus praying that we would all become some one blob of a human? No, that they may be united as we are. So Jesus isn't saying him and the Father are the same one God or one being, no. They are two different beings. He acknowledges that in John chapter 8. But what he is saying is that they are united. The reason these scriptures removed it, obviously you can see some of that Aryan thought creeping in, is because if one means united, then it destroys the Trinity. So it's easier to take it out rather than to keep it in. And it's funny, right? <laughs> because they even understand in some cases that the word should be united. And this speaks to what Jesus said in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 
not what Jesus said, what the Father said. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 to 9. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So the Father is speaking to the Son, and he says, Your throne, God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, your God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above the, your fellows. I'm just switching thy to your, um, just to make it easier. So one God as a God. If one God has a God, therefore it's two gods. So in First John chapter, uh, First John five seven, where it says, "For there are three that bear record in heaven." It's basically trying to make it clear there are three gods, not Trinity. Not Arianism. There are clearly three. They work together, but each of them are divine. Each of them eternal. Each of them uncaused. But that, that's not what the Trinity teaches. So I don't want to go off into a tangent because, you know, I can speak on the Godhead all day. And I'm, I'm sure I can even uh, tag in Brother Austin if he, if he wants to add verses. <laughs> Matthew chapter 5 I want to go to some egregious ones but just in case because if somebody tried to deny um, if somebody tried to deny 1 John 5 7 you also have 1 Thessalonians it doesn't, it doesn't get rid of the problem you also have 1 Thessalonians chapter 3.13 sorry not 3.13 3.11 but it's literally the same thing now, God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. It's not saying, um, <laughs> so God himself, there's the Holy Spirit. Why? Because John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit. So sometimes when referring to the Father, they may refer to the Father as God or Jesus as God. God. Or the Holy Spirit as God. But sometimes they will switch and they will just call the Holy Spirit God or just Jesus God. So Colossians 2 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. God, the Holy Spirit, one, and of the Father, two. End of Christ. Three. You know what? I'm not going to lie to you. I've, I completely, Colossians 2 2, never used it. So as he's posted this, this is, going, this is getting jotted down. Um, let me just quickly take note of that. Colossians 2 2, thank you for that. Uh, I will take note of that. Thank you. Um, I never used the New Testament when speaking on the Godhead. Well, I use it less, so much so that I've forgotten that actually there's quite a lot in there. Um, I tend to use the Old Testament a lot when showing the Godhead because it's just it's become addictive. People seem to, it's harder to fight in the Old Testament, I feel. But anyway, let's go to Matthew 5.22, where it says, but I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother Without a cause, now this is alterations. So if he's angry with his brother, without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. But I tell you again that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to the judgment. So in the NIV, it makes it look like any anger is a sin. No. You can have righteous anger. Let's say somebody is doing something evil, like the Lord. If... When Israel was evil, he was angry with them, right? That was a righteous anger because he was right. He was angry for good. He was zealous for good. That's why the evil made him angry. So you can be angry at evil when evil is present. But if you're just angry for the sake of hating someone without a cause, then it's sin. That's like the Satan hatred. He was just jealous of Christ and he hated him. But Christ did nothing towards him. He only gave him blessings upon blessings. Yet Satan decided, nah, I hate you. I want to kill you. 
So we see the evilness there of hatred, because hatred is what leads to murder. Man, I won't, I won't have time to go through every verse, but boy, I think how many verses have I got in here? It's quite a bit, but um, let me. I just want to point out some big offenders, but just quickly, actually, before I move on to the next one, I wonder if the NIV changed First Thessalonians. 311. Now may our God and Father himself. Ooh, yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. Wait, did you buy the book? <laughs> it's a great book. I'll tell everyone the book. It's really, really good. Um, but have you guys seen what they did there? It's a book which goes into a bit more detail on the like manuscripts and stuff like that. Um, if you want that level of depth. But I want everyone to notice this. Notice what they've done here. Hold up. I knew it. I knew it. Of course they had to do it. You see it. In the KJV it says, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. In the NIV, it says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come. To Do you see it? Do you see what they've done? <laughs> very, very sneaky. Yeah, it's meant to be the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul made it clear by saying God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. But what they've done is sometimes... Paul will say our God and Father, or our God, even our Father. But here he made it clear by saying God himself. So it's like pause, one being there, done. And then he, began, he begins the and. He's taken himself from literally the third place and made it like, what, the one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh word, when it's meant to be the third word. Now, I wonder if they've done this with Colossians 2.2. 2. Hold on, let me see. Colossians 2.2 2, NIV. Ah, yep, they've done the same thing. It says, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Where it says here, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Very, very... <laughs> Very, very sneaky. <laughs> very, very sneaky. That's not even sneaky. Yeah, you know, it's not even sneaky. It's just the audacity of it. Wow. Sorry, guys. I'm even finding these as, um, <laughs> as we're out here preaching. So anywhere where they clearly show three separate gods, they're removing it. <laughs> <laughs> they're removing it. Um, surprised they didn't touch Hebrews 1, chapter 8, verse 9. I guess that one would have been just too obvious. Uh, they really... Uh, sorry, guys. I'm, I'm just shocked. Because the... they did it with this as well. Let me show you. First, uh, the temerity. Watch this. First Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels. Uh, Timothy 3.16, NIV. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit. Do you see that? Did you catch that sleight of hand? Very subtle. Very, very subtle. God was manifest in the flesh. They changed it to he. Why? Because we know that God, there is one God that didn't come in the flesh. But when they say God, they mean the Father. And they mean that the Son and the Holy Spirit are just like emanations. Not emanations, but they are caused by the father 
very, very sly. At this point, even going through the Bible corruptions is is now turning into a Trinity thing once again. Man, they they just don't want to see the truth. Matthew three nineteen, no, Matthew nine thirteen. It says at the end where he says, "I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance." But in the NIV, it says, "For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners." No repentance. Once again, building up that doctrine of you can be <laughs> saved in your sin, not from your sin. <laughs> and the attack is wild. The attack is wild. Oh. Actually, let me bring out this one. Let me bring out this one. Now, this is also very subtle. Matthew 1.25. <laughs> so, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son. Pause. It's very subtle. Remember, the su subtlety is how the devil works. What is the big difference between these two? Till she had brought forth a firstborn son. Till she gave birth to a son. If you give birth to a son, he may not have brothers. But if you have a son that is a firstborn, it implies brothers and sisters or siblings. Now, Catholics believe that Mary died a virgin. They also believe Mary died sinless. And figure that one out. Um, so, essentially, by changing firstborn son to just son, it allows them to try and perpetuate the fact that no, Mary died a virgin. And I don't, I don't know why, no, it's the queen of heaven doctrine that they want to worship. Because I was about to say, I don't know why you want to hold on to a woman's virginity so much. Let her be. She's fulfilled prophecy. Let her go. My spirit rejoiceth in God my saviour. Matthew 5, 44. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, uh, they believe she died a virgin and sinless. As a Catholic, you have to hold to that, the sinlessness of Mary. Um, but I say unto you, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully use you. What did Jesus say? Bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you. Matthew 5, 44 NIV. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So what about the blessings? What about the uh, pray for them which despitefully use you? Gone. Absolutely just gone. Ooh, is this? Mm, should I use this one? Yeah, well, let's go. Yeah, <laughs> clearly they, she had brothers as well, right? Um, he had brothers. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Can I get Mark 1.1 1, 1, NIV? Okay, NIV has it. Let me see if it was... Mark 1.1 1, 1, ESV. Some of them they change. Son of God, Mark 1.1 1, 1, NASB. Ah, yes, this was a hypocrisy. This was a hypocrisy. Okay. So, the reason I brought this one up, notice they all include the title Son of God. You see those same manuscripts, those quote-unquote early witnesses, they remove Son of God. But they've added it here anyway. So the base manuscripts, which the NIV, the NASB, and the ESV are using, 
where they use that as a reason to say uh, the, man the early manuscripts, which is like two, didn't have, um, okay, it's not two, but you get the point, didn't have the uh, phrase son of, didn't have this phrase, therefore that's why we haven't included it. They also didn't have the son of God in Mark chapter one, verse one, yet they've included it anyway, because they clearly know that was wrong. So it's a double standard. In one case, if the early manuscripts doesn't have it, they've removed it. But in here, the early manuscripts did not have Son of God. When I say early, I'll, let me stop saying early because that even distorts it. The Vatican manuscripts, the Vatican manuscripts didn't have Son of God, but they've included it anyway. Because clearly, even that is a bit too extreme. So there's a version of the Vaticanus, I think it's the Vaticanus that doesn't have this. And there's a version of the Sinaiticus which doesn't have this in there, yet they include it anyway, which means that they're going back on their own method, uh, methodology. So when they try to say that, oh yeah, you know what, it's not in the early manuscripts, it's a, they don't care about early manuscripts. This is about doctrine, not manuscripts. Because if they want to stay consistent, then they should remove Son of God from there, but they know that'll be too obvious for some people, even though this is already obvious. Mark 9.24 and straight away the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. Immediately the boy's father claimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. What have, he, what have they removed? What have they removed? The father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. In Mark 9.24, Lord. He called him Lord. You're going to find this as well. In a lot of places, they remove Lord. Let me get into... Uh, what's the time now? Okay, let me brush up on a couple. Uh, there's just so many. I can't get through all of them. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm going to post one too. We're just having fun at this point. Um, <laughs> okay, let me... Let me conclude with, do, 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 do. as if I go on and on and on, we can be here all day. Um, and I will not have time for that. So, yeah, let me, let me conclude with Romans 8 verse 1, and then we'll pray. And then, you know what, we can just keep posting them if you want. Um, but I want to conclude with this. Because... As for verses, we got verse upon verse upon verse upon verse. And if we were to go through verses, we'll just be reading the, the Bible at this point, and it'll be too long. Romans 8.1, please. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Did you catch that? Did you guys catch that? <laughs> Once saved, always saved. So in one situation, it's, a, it's if you don't walk according to the flesh, but after the spirit. In another situation, it's, ah, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. Yeah, there's just no condemnation. Claim Jesus as Lord? Yeah, you're good to go. No condemnation. Condemnation? What's that? I've never heard of condemnation before. Actually, there was... Hold on. There was one more which was very egregious. Hold on. Um, let me see. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Nah, I'll leave it, I'll leave it. <laughs> I'll leave it. But I think we get the point. These bogus Bibles, you know, the NIV, the NASB, the ESV, and don't worry, I've got more. I can keep posting them if you want. Um, they are defiled bread. So yeah, the Bible is called the Word of God, right? And it's also known as it's spiritually bread, our daily bread. 
But if you start eating some of these other Bibles, you're going to be sick. Your belly will be full for a time, but then you're going to be like, what's this? I'm not feeling too good. Oh, what's this? And then you'll just spew out sin because you're eating false doctrine. We'll conclude Ezekiel 4.13. And the Lord said, even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, whither I will drive them. So, I pray everyone was blessed with what they heard this Sabbath day. Be careful of that defiled bread. And if you see anyone eating that defiled bread, try to warn them. And this is what I always do. This is, this is something that you can use. Just use a couple verses. Show them one. Just say, hey, have you seen this? Why is it not in that? Or have you seen this verse? Why is it not in there? Have you seen this verse? Why is it not there? So I pray everyone was blessed. And actually, as we know, we'll add your granddad to the prayer as we close out in prayer. So, um, is your granddad saved, by the way? And what I mean by saved, I mean, okay. Oh, oh, we'll pray that. So if we can all kneel, please do so. And let's lift up holy hands. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your Sabbath. Thank you for allowing us to come together and to go through your word and to um, learn through these studies. Uh, I mean, so much you've blessed us with on this Sabbath day and opened our eyes um, to the truth and to the deceptions so that we can stay on the path with a lamp that is well lit and we can have bread that is not defiled. And Father, we also lift up uh, Gabriel's granddad in prayer. Um, heal him, Lord, and give him a chance to receive the gospel with an open heart. Um, because we know you get, continue to give chances even until um, the time appointed for death, like the thief on the cross. So we lift him up to you, Father, and we lift up all those names that are in the hearts and minds of your people. And all those names in our prayer lists, protect them, Lord, give them more light. And even for those that have left or have received the preaching at one point and just aren't walking on the right path, Lord, continue to give them light as time goes on so that um, they can repent and turn back before it's too late. So we offer up all these prayers and requests unto you in the name of your Son, our Saviour and King, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.